Um, thank you so much for coming to our panel, especially given that it's the after lunch slot on Saturday, <laughs> on Halloween, on this beautiful day, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is Theater of the Translated. Um, we have a panel on translating drama, obviously. And um, I'm Jennifer Zobel. And uh, what gave rise to this panel was thinking about the fact, the sort of obvious fact that discussions of theater translation are often quite segregated from discussions of other kinds of literary translation. They tend to happen um, more within the theater community um, than within the literary translation community. And um, we've got a panel here of people who actually translate across genre. Um, one of our panelists does um, primarily now focus on translating drama, but the others are, are a combination, work in a combination of genres. So one of the things that we really wanted to emphasize in this panel is the distinct considerations that um, these translators have um, taken into account in their process of translating drama relative to their work in prose, poetry, and so on and so forth. So we're going to have them um, present one at a time on projects of, um, on dramatic projects that they've worked on that they consider particularly notable um, and uh, instructive. And um, then we're gonna open to questions from me, from one another, and from you as well. Um, so we're gonna start with Sean Bai, and I'll read his short bio from the program to introduce him. Um, Sean Bai is a translator, actor, and theater director, and humanities programmer for the Polish Cultural Institute in New York. His translations of Polish fiction, drama, and reportage have been published in Words Without Borders, Continents, and In Other Words. He is an artistic director of the London-based Invisible Theater. Thank you, Jen. Um, uh, my computer has decided that this is an excellent time to install a bunch of updates. So <laughs> I'm going to vamp for a little bit while my notes come up here. Um, I, was, uh, I, I lived in London for a long time and I was involved for two years with a company called the Invisible Theatre Company. We were uh, an online radio drama or audio drama company uh, that specialized in um, all kinds of writing from around the world. Um, because I was one of the co-founders of it, I, from the very beginning, uh, wanted the company to have a bit of an emphasis on uh, literature and translation. At the time, I was one of the British Center for Literary Translation mentees for Polish, and I was working with Antonio Lloyd-Jones, very well-known Polish translator. And so the, um, the translations that I did for the Invisible Theatre Company were sort of part of my initial education as a literary translator, which was really exciting. Um, uh, a few words about radio drama. This is a form that hasn't really persisted in the United States. Um, if you remember back from, I don't know, the 50s, the 60s, you had shows like The Shadow and this kind of thing on American radio. Um, they've kind of died out here, but in Europe and particularly in countries that have a strong tradition of a public broadcasting service, um, they have been maintained up to the present day. Um, and in countries, including in Poland, uh, prominent authors will write radio dramas as sort of as a, a part of their output. Um, and uh, so part of my interest was in sort of tapping into this unmined area of, uh, of Polish literature. Um, uh, we did three uh, translations of plays uh, in, in the course of the two years of sort of activity with Invisible Theater. Um, two plays by Chekhov, one of which was an old translation and one of which was my adaptation of an old translation. And we did one uh, original translation of a Polish play called The Death of the Mother Superior by uh, a Polish uh, writer and playwright called Adam Kamiński, who is based in Gdańsk. Um, uh, I, the, the play was chosen um, basically because it was really fun. <laughs> it's a kind of contemporary gothic horror story that takes place in a convent outside of Rome. The mother superior um, is dying. Everyone believes that she is imminently going to be made into a saint. And she reveals to her second in command um, that she was inspired to, to found this order of nuns by a visit from the devil. 
and that this is a secret that she has kept her entire life and is now admitting on her deathbed. Meanwhile, the Pope's envoy is rushing to the convent to hear her confession before she dies, and the two seconds in command at the convent decide that they must do anything they can to prevent this from happening, so they decide to murder the Mother Superior before she can meet the papal emissary, um, who at the end of the play we discover is the very demon who visited her in the first place and very carefully organized for all of this to take place. It's a wonderful play. Um, it's, uh, it's written in a very serious, very straight style, although the subject matter, I think especially for people from a Catholic background, is very funny. Um, it was very controversial in Poland. Um, it was, uh, Adam submitted it to the Polish National Broadcaster where it was rejected. Um, Poland is a very Catholic country and it was considered too sensitive material. Um, and so it was finally broadcast on Radio Gdańsk, which is where, uh, which is where Adam is based. Um, so, you know, for him, when I reached out to him about the play, this was sort of his opportunity for the play to have the kind of wider audience that he, wasn't, he didn't think it was ever going to have in Poland. I didn't tell him that as a small audio theater company, we didn't have that wider audience either. Um, but it was, um, uh, it, was a real, it was a real pleasure to do. Um, uh, there were a couple of sort of specific challenges related to producing the play and related to translating the play that I just kind of wanted talk through briefly here and then we'll we'll have some more discussion afterwards I guess um, uh, in terms of collaboration with the author Adam was involved we did have access to the original Polish production the recording of the Polish production um, uh, I thought it was worth mentioning rights with radio theater it's very uncommon for these plays to be broadcast more than once and so the, the production companies don't really have any interest in holding on to the rights in any way. And so we were very lucky that we were able to just make an agreement with Adam uh, and we were able to produce the play. I think we'll, th that's different for stage productions and I'm sure that's something that will come up in, in discussion. Um, uh, also on sort of more the production end of things than the translation things, we felt that the aesthetic of the Polish production needed adaptation. Um, the script, was very clear on sound effects and on transitions and kind of the soundscape that it wanted for the play and we stuck very faithfully to that. But the tone of it in Polish was very melodramatic. Um, and for instance, the character of the demon slash papal chaplain was sort of like this cackling like evil man. And, um, and in general, we felt that for a British audience, that needed to be toned down pretty considerably and we needed to do it much straighter. Um, we also um, we also had a particular translation issue with certain um, Catholic technical terms. There's a lot of discussion of the rules under which the convent operates, um, things like the seal of confession, which is a term that I had to look up. There's a dramatic moment at the end of the play, after the Mother Superior has died, um, where the chaplain recites a prayer which is very well known in Poland and which comes from the Middle Ages. And me being, I just sort of assumed, oh, well, the Catholic Church is everywhere. There must be an English version of this prayer. Well, there wasn't. And so we had to, um, I had to dig around in sort of like online texts of medieval books of hours to find something that would have been said under similar circumstances and had the same kind of poetry and the same kind of drama to it um, as this very well-known piece in Polish. Um, and I guess the only other thing that I'll say is that um, and I think this sort of this almost goes without saying with adapting or excuse me with translating drama, but there was a need to you know the translation had to be very very grounded in the speech and the dialect and the performance of the individual actors that we were working with. And this is a script that was done you know tied to a particular production. Um, we did continually adapt the script as we rehearsed it. Um, I was an American writing for British actors um, and we had to be sensitive to giving them a kind of language that they were able to work with. We were lucky to have very capable actors. We also had a thing going on where um, we, had mul we had actors playing multiple parts and the device that we used to distinguish them, one of the devices we used was by giving them different accents. And so there was a certain degree to which I needed to use regionalisms with these different accents. Again, all in the spirit of sort of making the actors comfortable in the text. Um, 
so, you know, overall, it didn't feel universes apart from the kind of work that I had been doing with translation of, of prose. And I, I mostly translate fiction and literary nonfiction. Um, but the, sort of the, the emphases were in different places. Um, it's also worth saying that I re-listened to this play this morning for the first time in quite a while, and I don't actually like the translation very much. <laughs> um, and so I think that maybe I was I I was not sensitive enough to those uh, to those needs of speech and and of performance. Um, so that's that was sort of a funny revelation that I had this morning. Um, so anyway, yeah, I just wanted to present that as sort of a little case study of a slightly unusual type of dramatic uh, of dramatic translation. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Anne okay. from there. Are you going to? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so next up we have Anne Poston. And Anne has a quite short bio. Too. Oh, do I? Very fast. <laughs> Anne Poston <laughs> translates contemporary German literature and teaches writing at Queen's College, CUNY. <laughs> oh, that's all true. <laughs> Not a lie in there. Um, my experience translating drama is actually, I think I'm, I'm the least experienced person on this panel, um, but also it's, it's limited in comparison to my translating of poetry and prose. Um, not only that, but the history of my work in dramatic translation to me feels in some ways like a history of failures, um, but I think, I think those failures themselves bring up some interesting questions about uh, the conversation around translating drama as opposed to the conversation around um, translating other types of genres. And also, I have started wondering, um, what is failure? I mean, I, I ultimately think that my, I'm quite satisfied with my translation. Um, so the idea that I was failing in some way, I think, brings up its own questions. Uh, I'm also going to talk about a specific project. Um, it's actually the only play I've translated in its entirely entirety, and it's a, by a young, fairly young German playwright named Oliver Kluck. Um, and I found, I found Oliver when I was looking for a project specifically to propose for a Fulbright grant. Um, I had been interested in translating drama for a long time because I'm interested, I've always been interested in theater in my non-professional life, but I'd found, I found it hard to find an entry point. I'd find, found it hard to find a project to tackle. Um, and in fact, my previous, um, another project had ended in failure when I was about to propose a translation for my MFA thesis, and the night before, I found out that it had just been translated and was about to be produced in Chicago. Um, and while, in retrospect, that's, it, I should have known. Um, it was a really well-known German playwright. Um, it also, um, it was easy for me to overlook as, an, as someone inexperienced in translating drama in a way that I think is sort of indicative um, of the way the conversation happens. Um, and the fact that that conversation is so segregated from much of the conversation about translating literature because dramatic translation is so often done specifically for production um, with publication happening maybe as an afterthought, if at all, this translation left a much less easily Googleable trail. It didn't really pop up until it was about to go up on stage. So I, didn't, I had no idea that it was already in the works. Um, and, and so, Sort of by the same token, I discovered Oliver Cook, this playwright, through a mutual friend rather than through more, to, more traditional research channels, which is how I usually find um, novels or poets that I'm going to translate. Um, and that, it, uh, that's because, as I said, it's been sort of difficult for me to find these projects to work on. It's difficult enough to find novelists to work on when I have to order them from Germany. But with a, with a play, if I go to, say, a great production at one of the major Berlin houses, chances are that person is already in translation or his agent is looking to find a translator. In other words, it's sort of out of my range. It's not in the same ballpark as the things that I'm working on um, that are destined for publication. Um, so I got in touch with Cook directly. He sent me a number of scripts. I found them interesting. He expressed his support for having me work on them, though he didn't seem interested in collaboration very much. He said, that's, you do it talk to me if you have any questions, I'm happy to meet you. Um, but he did go so far as to write me a letter of support for the project, and then I got to Berlin, and he never responded to my emails again. Um, so <laughs> the actual process of translation took place basically in a vacuum. I did not have any input from him, nor did I have any access to other productions or to anyone who had seen another production. Um, so I think that's somewhat 
my sense is that that's somewhat unusual in the translation of contemporary plays, um, though maybe less unusual for other types of translation. I mean, I have, for any other contemporary work, authors I've worked on, I have talked to the author, but only at the end of the process. It's not been what I would call a collaboration in the traditional sense. Um, so initially, this inability to talk to the playwright or collaborate with him seemed to me to present a significant problem. Um, though Cluck's work has been fairly widely performed and has gotten some critical acclaim, as I said, I was unable to find a production anywhere in the German-speaking world in the year that I was there. Um, and the problem was that, or one of the problems was that Cluck's plays, and specifically this play, is pretty formally untraditional. Um, for example, the first page of the play is a letter. It's just a traditional letter, and there are, there's no indication given of whether this is supposed to be read, how it's supposed to be read, by whom it's supposed to be read, is it supposed to be projected on a screen? No idea. It's just a letter, and that's the beginning of the play. Um, and indeed, there are no stage directions in the play whatsoever. There are no notes about the characters, no, no talk about scenery, nothing like that. Um, and another, perhaps most oddly, um, the script isn't written in what we think of as traditional script format. So usually you expect to see something like, Dr. Colon, we should take your mother to the private clinic. Most of this is, we should take your mother to the private clinic, says the doctor. Um, so how do you perform that? I have no idea. Um, and my inclination at first was to wonder about that and to think about how that would function in production and sort of tailor my translation to that. But I didn't, I didn't have access to any more information, and so I stopped thinking about it. And I translated it exactly the same way that I translated a novel. I just, I, I translated it. Um, by the same token, the dialogue is somewhat unusual, not, not crazy, but somewhat unusual. I mean, I think uh, one of the theories behind the fact that so much of dramatic translation takes place by people who work in theater and who do not do other types of translation is the emphasis on performability and then it should sound like really natural spoken dialogue. Um, but this play didn't sound like natural spoken dialogue in the first place. It had a lot of sort of um, poetic devices like repetition, strange punctuation. Um, so again, I didn't try to make it sound natural. I translated like I would translate poetry or prose. Um, next challenge was the play's cultural context. Um, which I would have loved to at least speak to the playwright about. It's it's pretty, it's pretty rooted in the cultural context. It's a contemporary play. Um, I assume, since there are no directions, I don't know, but I assume the characters are about in their mid thirties, um, and so the play is very rooted in ideas about the world that these people grew up in. So that would have been a divided Germany. Um, and the repercussions that world has for today. So how that world turned to this one, the problems that grew out of that world. Um, and so there are a lot of references to that, um, to that context, particularly the title itself, um, which is in German, Die Froschpotze Lederfabrik, um, in English. Cover your ears, ears if you need to. In English, that's the Frog Cunt Leather Factory. Um, which is, which is not exactly as bad as it sounds. It's actually a specific reference to East German slang. Um, Froschpotzenleder was a sort of pejorative term for cheaply made um, East German synthetic leather. leather. Um, but that term, is not, that's not, that term is not widely known. It's very specific. And my understanding is that much of the play's audience wouldn't know the reference. Um, I spoke to a lot of Germans and they had all these other ideas and I said, no, no, I've, I've done the research, I think it refers to this. Um, so in that instance, as in others, I felt licensed to translate it literally. If the, if the audience wouldn't have understood necessarily the context, it, it, is clear, it is clear in context, but if they wouldn't have known the term already, I didn't see any reason to, to pursue that route any further. Um, and at the end of the day, I did think that this was a play that was worthy of being translated, though it's rooted in this cultural context. Its concerns are very, um, very translatable, very important, I think, to, to, to us, especially in the US today. Um, and translating it in a way that softened or broadened those cultural references, I think, would have been boring and unnecessary and dishonest. So I didn't do that. Um, so. 
back to the failures. Though I was disappointed about this inability to contact the author, I think at the end of the day, it led me to wonder about um, what I've come to understand as the traditional process for translating drama and wonder about how this failure led to some, some successes. I ultimately feel very satisfied with the product that I produced. I haven't really looked into um, forums for productions of it yet, um, but it made me sort of wonder if the collaborative model where a translator you know, works with a team for production, though obviously really productive for that production, can be limiting in some ways. Um, limiting not only in terms of the production choices, um, but also in the lifespan of the text. If it's, you know, if production choices are written into the translation, that makes it less interesting for future productions, I think. Um, and though, of course, all translation contains a degree of interpretation, when I'm translating a non-dramatic text, it's my goal to leave interpretive possibilities as open as possible, and I think that's perhaps an important thing to try in drama as well. Um, uh, a director in the original language hasn't had those interpretations already inserted. Um, whether he's whether the original language director is working with the playwright or not, that's a different collaboration. And I think leaving those things open um, in translation can be ultimately really productive. Um, I don't really have a conclusion. In conclusion, uh, this is a thing that I tried and it worked out pretty well. Maybe we can all think about different opportunities for drama translation. Um, so before I introduce uh, the second half of our panel, um, I just want to note that um, due to an entirely happy coincidence, we ended up having on our panel two people who've worked on the same author and actually um, worked together in a, in a way, which you'll hear about. So in addition to hearing each of them talk about their work individually, we'll also talk a little bit about this sort of shared context um, that they have. So first we have um, Marguerite Feitlewitz and Margaret Feidlewitz's most recent book translation is Salvador Novo's Pillar of Salt, an autobiography with 19 erotic sonnets. Recent publications include stories by Luisa Valenzuela, Claudia Hernandez, and poems by Liliana Blanc in Rupemel's In Translation and the Sonora Review. Thank you, Jen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I don't, I don't hear any failure at all with you <laughs> in what you recounted. Um, I, I, we have a lot to talk about, I'm sure, with everybody in the room. Um, I, um, I'm going to talk, um, Fatima and I do have this really amazing kind of serendipity, which we'll get to in a little while. I, I want to talk about two plays, um, um, because they are both literally theater of the translated. Um, um, the very first play I translated and, and, and had published was, was this play, Liliane Atlan's uh, Monsieur Fugue which was published by um, Say, um, and it came to me the way every good thing in my life seems to come to me, which was by accident, um, through the good graces of somebody who came to me. Monsieur Fugue was, um, um, uh, is um, a play uh, that is about um, Janusz Korszak, who is a Polish, was a Polish educator and radio, very in involved in radio drama, as a matter of fact, and radio education, radio art. Um, who also had an orphanage for Jewish children during the time of the Nazi occupation. And he was, uh, when um, uh, his, um, he accompanied a group of Jewish children, um, we, we, we believed Auschwitz, though there is a last sighting of him um, with this group of children. Um, they were never seen again. Lilian, a French Holocaust writer, spent the war years in hiding. Um, uh, and has was very deeply involved in um, um, after the war she was part of um, this um, Jewish Academy that Derrida and all of the sort of Jewish intellectuals of that time participated in um, this is a play that takes place in the truck that is taking them to what is called in the play Rotberg um, it is um, um, and what happens in this 
play. It opens. The children come up out of a out of a sewer. They are they are bestial looking. They are they are starving. They are filthy. They are cruel, and um, for all that has been going on to, around them and is being done to them, um, a, the the Nazi officer Christophe, who has set foot to the ghetto and is lying in wait, playing dead, captures them. Monsieur Fug, who was based on Janusz Korshak, tries to come to their rescue. They're all put into le camion, the truck, and the whole play takes place in the truck, and it is literally a theater of the translated. What happens in this play is that the children grow up, literally. They grow up and they grow old. And, um, and so by the end of the play, they are truly, truly old. And I'll just read you. So the, the, um, the uh, challenge in this play was that these are children. The play should be done with children. And we did it once with children. And it's, it's um, we can talk about that. Um, but they are children who have been sort of decivilized, if you will, at the beginning of the play through having been brutalized. Um, they retain fragments with which they sort of torment each other. There's a certain amount of play acting. A lot of it they have a doll who is Tamar, who is a child who didn't survive, but they keep her with them, this doll. Um, and they go through all of the lives that they might have led, um, including Two of them who might who would would marry have a fairly miserable but long enduring marriage. Uh, Abrasha, um, a diminutive for Abraham, who was to be a, an opera composer, but a, a tormented one, never knowing if he would finish his opera. Um, Yona, who was to be a rabbi. Yosela, who was to be something else. And so they all go they go through all of this. And so the the challenge was that. This, these are French children whose French is very inflected by Yiddish, um, and and um, and then and and a lot of the the really nasty sort of language and references that they've learned in the ghetto and in the camps in the ghetto actually, and um, and then the vestiges of what we can see were a bourgeois education and and genteel life, and so it all comes it's all kind of mixed as they grow, uh, as they as they grow old. And by the end of the play, they are truly old. Um, and I'll just read a couple of things very, very briefly to give you a sense of some of the translation um, issues. They also had gone to Hebrew school. <laughs> okay, So it was clear that they had been um, steeped, as Lilian was, not just in you know, general um, sort of basic Hebrew school teaching, but also in Talmud and the, the, the sacred tales. Um, and so, for example, one of the s songs they sing at the very beginning is Abracha. They say, huh, what if we rested? Not already. There, there there'll be wheat, taller than we are. We'll go get there and be safe. Sing us something, Raisa. I'm beat. I don't want to. Raisa, we're in the forest. Sing us something. Beat. Raisa sings in her broken voice, sometimes very sweetly, then again hoarsely. Don't ask why, ill-loved and mortal mother, we the golem with dreams gone dry, our hands are made to be broken. Not so loud. And so they sort of go back and forth between these different registers. Um, whose fault if you sleep on an earth that despises you? We the golem with dreams gone dry, our hands are made to be broken. Um, and so they, they sort of, one of the things that they do is they break apart the stanzas of this song and then sing them singly and together. And that's when they're still kids. Um, and by the end of the, the play, um, when um, Christopher is giving them their last chance to do the jump rope game to see if they can survive it, which they, they won't. They will be killed, and they know it. Yosela says to Christophe, as though he were a doctor, don't lie like that, doctor. I'm not going to last much longer. You jump, I let you leave. The forest doesn't fall You far. You walk free. Yosela, still to his imaginary doctor, don't give me all these drugs. I don't want to go to sleep. I want to see everything right up to the end, like at a fete. Christopher, you're young. You'll make it to the sea. You'll be saved. Raisa, visiting the hospital. 
The nurses say it isn't visiting hour, but me, I don't let myself be pushed around. You, you feel better, Yosala? Yosala, I'm going away, Raisa. Raisa, that's not true. You just have to eat. Yosala, go get a bracha. I'm going to throw a party. Raisa, what party? Yosala, I don't know. Go quickly. I can't breathe anymore. So like that. They cannot hear. Oh, I'm sorry. You couldn't hear any of that? <laughs> Whoopsie. Microphone? I don't know. No, um, it's just no, it's just okay. I'm sorry. We don't. This room hasn't had mics during the conference. Yeah. Did anybody hear any of that? No. Oh. Sort of, kind of. Okay. All right. Maybe you could move in. Yeah. Th that that would be that would be better. And so the the point is, so Abracha finally says, "I brought you my opera. I finished it for you." And they sing, they sing a final, like a Kaddish, right? They sing this to their dying friend. Nothing like with, and one of the things that they're singing is a lesson from a geography class they had in elementary school when they were told by their teacher, nothing lasts save erosion. And they sing this like a Kaddish. Nothing lasts save erosion. This is the code. You will smile, you will smile, even if living hurts you. To smile, you will smile, even if living hurts you. And the grass, the birds, the stones will remember you. And the grass, the birds, the stones will remember you. And then Abracha says, there is nothing to say. Howl, that's all. Cry, but cry. Did you go to the cemetery, Raisa? Did you say the prayers? Raisa, haggard like an amputee, yes. And Abracha, already more than a year ago, you've got to live still and all. So they're con consoling her as though she were a widow. And the play is going to end. And the last line of the play is they are helped down from this truck where they're going to be shot. And Raisa says, I still would not have wanted to see all this dirt. And Abracha says, oh, you know, in a bed or in a valley, which is something he had said earlier. It doesn't matter where you die, in a bed or a valley. And so the, the, um, the challenge in, in this play was to try to capture all these, all these different registers, but to let it know that somehow the children, they had become old, but, they, but the speech was, it was, there was a certain amount of role playing in the speech, which was both authentic but it was children doing it as they're about to die. So that was, um, that was, a, that was a kind of um, a, um, an amazing thing to do. I was very lucky to work with Lilian during that time, um, and we did a lot of reading out loud in French, and, and um, in French, actually. Um, so I just thought that was, that was the kind of, um, in a novel, for example, or in a fiction, I've often had to switch from one register to another, but you somehow get narrative time. <laughs> and um, in a play, it just has to happen. And it's got to be speakable, and it's got to be all those ellipses, ellipses and all those things that characters remember that other characters have said. You've just got to slip in there, hoping against hope that your audience also remembers the way your characters remember. So I just thought I would throw that out, um, which we can talk about. Um, I also um, it was getting to Fatima. <laughs> um, um, oh they, so they're continuing the serendipity. I was um, introduced to the work of Griselda Gambaro by mutual friends in Paris. And Griselda is generally considered to be the most important 20th century Latin American playwright. She's Argentine. Her work was banned by the last dictatorship. She was forced into exile, where she wrote no plays. Uh, she said, without my, my audience, I, I can't write plays. So she wrote, um, no, she wrote a novel during the three years they were in exile. Before she uh, left for exile, she wrote the title piece here, Information for Foreigners, Información para Extranjeros, um, in 70-71, which was before the dictatorship that began on March 24, 1976. And it's truly a prophetic play. It foretells the coming era of state terrorism and the disappeared and, um, and torture. Uh, torture was, an, I should say, is an old story in Argentina, um, but it, never <coughs> on the scale it had been um, as in the last dictatorship. So this play, which is again literally theater that translated, it takes place 
um, in um, a non-traditional space, a warehouse um, is what it's called for, could be a house, a big house, and you walk in and the audience is separated into groups, each group gets its guide, and um, the audience is together, and then they separate going through the house and the scenes, which take place in different rooms um, in a different order um, to converge on the final scene. And this is a play that um, has is extremely, um, it has only one, two scene suite that are straightforward, limpid, um, in dramaturgical, uh, in a dramaturgical sense. Every other scene is extremely stylized um, and what we would later call intertextual. Um, there are um, there are lines from Juan Gelman, the great Argentine poet that the great Lisa um, Rose Bradford translates, and in fact he gets the final words in the play as a tribute. Um, they were close friends. Um, there is also a scene from Shakespeare, um, um, uh, the Grupo 69, or, or the 69 theater group was arrested while it was rehearsing Othello and she put the scene that they were rehearsing at the time of their arrest and we read this scene. The rehearsal, the arrest, and then which goes right into an extraordinarily rapid um, vaudeville in the judges' chambers. Um, so there was also Grand Guignol, um, a lot of very um, unforgiving, um, rapid fire rhyme, and a lot of um, frankly and deliberately on her part, bad writing and calling for bad acting so as not to eroticize violence, eroticize torture, eroticize fear. Um, and so it, had there been a, a, um, a collaboration with future producers or actors who might likely say, I won't look that ugly, I won't do that, I, that's, I don't understand this style, um, it could have been really disastrous. She always intended it, as she said, to be an impossible play. Um, and um, and it's had a very odd trajectory. Um, she it was hidden in her um, nightgown drawer um, when it and it was it went undiscovered during police searches of the house because the police couldn't like bring themselves to go into her her you know unmentionables drawer. Um, and when she was in exile, it was a couple of scenes were published in Italy in a theater journal. Um, there was a, um, an apartment production in the former Yugoslavia, um, but it was not published, um, and, and it actually was published in English before it was published in Argentina. And it's never been produced in Argentina, but it has had productions um, in the States and in Zimbabwe. It was done by former students of mine from Harvard who actually had a professional theater company in Zimbabwe, and it was done just last year at Connecticut College. So when a playwright says something's impossible, <laughs> it's obviously a kind of a magnet for a certain kind of director. Um, what else did I want to say? So I guess I, I would say the other thing that she incorporated were newspaper clippings from the time, because the whole question of who was a foreigner is very much in the air. She meant it to be her compatriots. But also she received, as she was sort of finishing the play, um, when she returned from exile, um, from a former political prisoner, she received in the mail a poem, um, which is in the play and created a scene. And I'll, I'll just read it quickly. Um, it's a girl. Um, it, it's in one of the repeating scenes. It's, it's, she's, um, the scene is she's um, stretched out on a cot and um, she's breathing in a very labored way, and she has a sheet folded over her feet. And the guide advances on tiptoe and says, don't make any noise, she's sleeping, to his group. And he looks at her and he says, how are you doing? This girl has been tortured, we, we know that, okay? And she sits up and very simply and colloquially says, I would like to die as softly as possible so that my friends will think she is sleeping in the earth, become a worm digging in the earth, so that in spring the flowers blossom. After my death, I want my children to sit at the table and say, at her age, Mama ran off with some guy. What a shame, poor old dad staring at the tablecloth, his cup of coffee, searching for her. This is how I want to die, 
as simply as though I had never lived. What a lovely thought to leave like that, not causing any pain. The cup of coffee that no one drinks, absent. And then silently, a character mixed in with the audience steps forward and strangles her. And she offers no resistance and just dies. And so this is sort of um, typical of this play, where you're having a moment of, of, of what we could call poesia humilde. This is not maybe professional poetry, um, but it's very moving and very straightforward. And it's a moment of kind of forthright feeling and then she's killed by maybe the person who's standing next to you and you don't know, right? Is, was this part of the play? Is it not part of the play? And so maintaining that, and this is the last thing I want to say before we go on to Fatima, maintaining that kind of tension in a play that's moving around a lot and where things are up in the air, there's a certain amount of, um, um, I think, frustration with not knowing that one is always cherry about um, um, overburdening. So I would say that for me, one of the, in the plays I've translated, they've had everything that I've ever had to deal with in, in fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, plus they're also plays. Um, so I would just leave it there. Okay. Can I use your jacket? Yeah, oh, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, absolutely. We're having a little crisis of temperature here. Yeah. I am from desert. <laughs> so um, lastly, we have Fatima Badami, and uh, um, Fatima Badami is a PhD candidate in theater and performance of the Americas at Arizona State. She holds a BA in English literature and an MA in drama studies from the University of Tehran. She translated two plays by Grisel de Galvaro, The Walls and Antigona Furiosa, into Persian. Oh, hello. Uh, so uh, I just remember that I translated another play in 2005 <laughs> that I forgot. That was by Tom, Tom Stoppard, oh, uh, wow. the real inspector. Hound, Hound, yeah. Hound. Yeah. Hound. So it was in the publication company for one year, and then somebody else, I don't know, translated and published it before me. Oh, no. So, so it, it was burned. So uh, I did that because I wanted to go to the, the drama uh, the department and they said that okay you don't have any experience in drama or writing so you, you are English t uh, student so translate something they need translation so I did that to pass the interview <laughs> so uh, so the, this uh, for my uh, uh, this uh, master thesis uh, I one of my friends from London sent me two books. One of them was this uh, information for foreigners that uh, Margaret uh, already trans and translated that from Argentinian to English. So I read this uh, just to get a sense of how theater works in Argentina. Uh, then the, the topic for my dissertation was uh, revolutionary theater in Latin America. So and then, when I read the the walls, it was really uh, it really touched me and it was really revolutionary and very ideological for me. So because I was act <laughs> uh, I was an activist in Iran at that time. So I said okay. So I thought I am very uh, smart. So I said okay. And instead of just talking, you know, talking about. Uh, politics in Iran or dictatorship in Iran, maybe I can talk about uh, dictatorship in Argentina and introduce some techniques that the people were using at that time and translate a, a play, a sample, and say, okay, that's about Argentina, you know, I'm not doing anything in Iran. So, but they were smarter than me <laughs> because when, <laughs> so uh, the, uh, I, I contacted my, we don't have copyright in Iran, but I wanted to just to know Margaret know that and, um, that I am doing that. So she kindly accepted and gave me the permission. She sent me a letter uh, to, to put in my book as, a, as an introduction, something. So you contacted Mar uh, Griselda too, right? Yes, and she was delighted as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. because if she, if she couldn't understand English, I couldn't understand uh, Spanish. So she was also hanging up on me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm kidding. So, uh, so then, 
It was uh, published uh, before the election 2009. The uh, that. We, we thought that, that there was a, a fraud in the election and they changed the result and Ahmadinejad became the president again. So we were protesting and all this stuff. And they, many people were killed or disappeared, exactly uh, like what happened in Argentina 30, 40 years ago, or 50 years ago. Yeah, so, uh, so there are, I'm, I'm gonna talk about some um, challenges that I had and then talk about the production, which was banned in Iran. So uh, why this play? So I said it was a, um, the the author uh, author's ideology, or I don't know uh, how you say goal was something you know like was close to me to mine. So I uh, and also also it, it was a part of my dissertation. So my thesis. So. That is why I chose this play, and so I focused. I didn't know anything about the translation theories like performability or readability, or you know, I didn't know Susan Bassnett or Pavi or people like that. But uh, because my background was uh, literature, so I was focusing on the text and you know, literary. I mean, how you say, uh, readability rather, rather than performability, because I didn't know any production team. I wasn't in theater. I was in. Uh, uh, playwriting program. So uh, some stuff that, so the another things was censorship. I knew that we cannot talk about sex in, uh, in, in the play, so there was, a, a, there was a dialogue that they are talking about the, do you have venereal, why, why don't you have appetite? Maybe you have venereal disease, right, STD. So I had to cancel that. <laughs> So, because we don't have venereal disease in Iran, you know, we cannot have sex. <laughs> so, oh, another one was uh, Margarita's letter. So she mentioned the name of uh, an Iranian. Do you want to talk about that, Mansur Farhang? Oh, it just it, um, one of my dear colleagues at Bennington was Mansur Farhang, who um, was the um, one of the architects of the revolution that went bad. Um, and he was the, the Iranian ambassador to the UN at the time of the hostage crisis. And he resigned his post um, because of, of the non-release of the hostages. And he is, has never been able to go back to Iran since. And so when Fatima wrote to me, I told Mansour quite excitedly about this, this serendipity. And he too was delighted. So, so your project had delight from all sorts of corners. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but so when I quoted Mansour in the letter, which I, um, he was pleased to do. The publisher then, said that, yeah. oh, we cannot mention his name. Right. It's forbidden. So I talked to Margaret and I said, oh, we have to cancel <laughs> his name. <laughs> so we canceled that line too. So another thing was that, uh, uh, so there are some uh, expressions. That I don't know if they are Argentinian or English, like, you cannot expect a pearl tree to give you apple or something like that. Or, so there's stuff like that. When I wanted to find an Iranian ex, um, equivalent and put that in the, uh, I mean, in the dialogue, people read that and said that, what, what do you mean by this? Like, poyo neshabes, yeah. It doesn't, it's not working. It's just throwing us off of the text because it's Argentinian. The setting is, you know, in Argentina. Everything is Argentinian. Dialects are foreign. So you, you better translate those things into Farsi instead of finding a Farsi things, you know, Farsi uh, proverb or idioms for them. So they wanted to, uh, to the text to be foreign because I don't know that it's, prestigious or because they want to know more about their foreign countries or foreigners. So when sometimes some translators, they use uh, Farsi expressions, people, they're like, it's not, it's not Iran. So we know that it's not Iran, it's not working. It's uh, the opposite of what uh, happened here. You know, people want everything to be Americanized. Mm -hmm. So this is the challenge that I have with my new play that I'm working on. So like, this be my witness. In Farsi, we, you know, we say something else, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had to translate them, you know, Mark, Shahed, Amboshe, stuff like that. So, and politeness. So sometimes, like, when they are talking about us, so 
<laughs> she just said ass. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to put something more polite, you know. So uh, uh -huh, for those lines that uh, were Italians and French, I had to put footnotes because hmm. I assume that people might not know Italian, you know. I mean, uh, intellectuals or uh, scholars may know French in Iran mm -hmm. because we have a lot of French words, mm -hmm. but so I put some footnotes for the readers. That is another reason that it's not performable because it's not for the readers, you know? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. After the election, uh, in three occasions, uh, the, the, the publisher called me and she said that Dr. Hockey is going to uh, stage the play and she, she, um, he wants your permission. And I said, I need to, I think I called Yeah, you. I'm I, sure I, you did, yeah. yeah. I said, I need to talk to Margaret and Griselda. So they said, okay, so, uh, so they rehearsed the play for one month and something and when they send the play to the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance, the same ministry gave the permission to the book to be published, but af it was before the election. After the election, they said, oh no, we can, you cannot stage this play. It's very political. It's about a guy who was kidnapped in Argentina, and it, it, it was happening in Iran a lot at that time. So they, uh, he, he couldn't do that. So his student was, wanted to do that for his thesis in on campus so he said maybe on campus they don't care because you know police there is no police to come to the show and watch so uh, but he after a while he said that he couldn't do that either after I don't know and there was another group in my city Bandarabas that they were trying to do that but uh, his understanding a director understanding was different he thought that that is psychological play and all these people are voices inside his head the young man's head and I said oh no that is no that is political play so for some reason this one didn't happen to so but when I came to US in 2012 uh, I with the help of my friend and a friend I staged that and uh, mm, I added some green movement or we, we, we were called green movement I mean after the election those people we had green signs, like green t-shirt, green. Uh, so because green is the sign of hope in Iran, so uh, that candidate that we voted and wasn't elected for some reason, I don't know, they changed the result. Uh, he ha how you say that? He was the uh, leader of the green movement. So I used some of these green movement elements, like green t-shirt, or we at the end we projected some photos from Argentina and from Iran, green movement and stuff. So uh, the new play that I'm working, so I said the culture is different here, so people want to see the Americanized stuff. And, uh, and I took some uh, translation courses, and I, I read about performability and uh, stuff like that. Although Susan Bassnett then changed her her, the, her notions about performability, and she said, no, just readability and stuff. So, but uh, I, I talked to my supervisor, and she said that uh, we, can, um, we can do a, a, a participant observation. So after I'm done, with, I'm done with the translation, we can uh, um, do play reading or stage the play for the American audience and see their reactions. If they are okay with the Farsi stuff, with Iranian stuff, oh, we can keep them. If not, we, we have to Americanize or change them. But I still believe in the foreignness because I think Americans are becoming more open to, you know, foreigners and foreign cultures, I think, so I don't know. So uh, um, there are a lot of metaphors in the play. And in, more interestingly, this play was a stage after the election, although it was political, but because it was comedy and the, uh, the playwright used a lot of metaphors, they couldn't uh, they couldn't get that, and they so it was uh, it was a stage. So I'm gonna so um, I'm gonna um, give you an uh, can I to explain the theme of the play? So it's it's uh, exactly what was happening during Ahmadinejad. So uh, is the group of there are a, there is a group of people that uh, sign sign a contract. They need the money really bad and. Uh, they are in debt, uh, 30 million, you know, 
two months. So they signed a contract with a guy we don't know, a contractor, uh, to dig, to dig, uh, dig two thousand graves for the enemy that might attack Iran in the future. We don't know who is the enemy. We don't know. Uh, we, we don't know the name of the country. I forgot. I said. I didn't. I, uh, I, I did a mistake. So my attack the country that they are living in, uh, and then they are living in a, uh, on, on the border. So and uh, so the, the they are digging, and after one year, two years, they are done, and then they go to get the money from the contractor, and he said. Oh, I am sorry. The enemy hasn't attacked us yet. Attacked us yet, so we cannot pay you. You have to wait for the enemy. So they are, tr <laughs> they are waiting for the enemy, and they are trying to uh, to do some stuff to provoke the enemy to attack Iran. And then, you know, they start the war and kill them, and then they steal the graves. But you know, some of the stuff that they are thinking to do is that uh, to show to. Sh to give, to go to the border and swear, curse the enemy, or to go to the border and give, give them the finger. <laughs> <laughs> but in Farsi, we don't say a finger. It, in Farsi, this is a curse, okay? But in, in here, in, uh, sorry, here, so another finger is curse. Mm -hmm. So I had to change this, okay, and instead of saying give them the thumb, I said, okay, let's give them this finger. <laughs> so this is another challenge that I have to choose if that is um, in America, that is the setting is Iran. So, uh, so another th challenge is the, this, uh, uh, th uh, this idioms or metaphors that they are using. So I'm gonna read a short dialogue. It's rough. I just finished it two weeks ago. I need uh, someone to proofread it, and I need to talk about that in the workshop. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to read a line from uh, by Oscar Wilde that my supervisor <laughs> told me last week. If you want to tell people the truth, make them laugh, otherwise they will kill you. So I think that is the reason why this play was a stage and not my, not your your play. So Griselda's play. So in this scene, this uh, this guy is trying is trying to talk to them to start uh, to how to initiate the war. So the word that we use in Farsi to uh, we say send the rat. Send the rat means uh, when you send the rat to somebody's party or house, everybody freaks out and you know, and then uh, you make the you annoy you annoy the person. So they are using the expression send the rat, and I I haven't found the equivalence for that in English, but my professor suggested that I use, I put send the rat, but when you, when the audience, maybe I can put footnotes, but for the readers, but not for the audience, uh, how am I supposed to tell them what is send the rat? So, memoir, war, war, not in a bad way, we just need to initiate the war. Not in a bad way, God forbid, we are not traitors or anti-revolutionary or anything like that. We are sure 100% that we can't beat the enemy. We only need to send the rat. And when they shoot us, our soldiers will attack and destroy them. Everybody is silent. Or we first make sure our soldiers are equipped enough and then send it. How does it sound like? Everybody is silent. Or we will first get a permission from whoever on top and then send the rat. What, what do you think? Everybody is telling. Or, or Tutti, can you check on the potatoes? So, this is, yeah, that was the send the rat part. I don't know how to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know it was rough. I mean, it was not fluent. It's the it's, dialogue. No, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, you you suggest me please for send the rat. <laughs> 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 so I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. So we actually don't have much time left, so I, I have a couple of questions, but I'd really like to open it to you first rather than continuing to talk on the floor. So does anyone out there have any questions? And then I can chime in at the end with any additional ones at this time. I'd like to offer a kind of a, a little bit of amplification on my own experience. Most of what I'm hearing here is engagement with literary texts rather than the whole process, since theater is for presentation on, on, on stage. Uh, I'm in a situation where I operate a website devoted to theater in Central Texas, so I have a lot of contacts in, the, in that theater area, which is quite extensive. 
one of them asked me to, well, can you suggest a play for Latin America? And I thought, great opportunity to do a translation. So I uh, went looking and found an Argentine playwright, I found a Mexican playwright, was unable to get any contact with the public, uh, with the publisher or with the playwright in Argentina. <clears throat> I was able to get a reply back from the Mexican publisher who said, oh, well, we don't have the rights. He's, he's died, his heir has the rights. And so I worked and worked and tried to get permission to translate because I didn't want to invest myself in it. First of all, rights for, to translate, and then second of all, uh, there would be the question of rights to perform. Yeah. I didn't want to jump into, into the void. A, a separate example, I read about a play that was published in Stockholm. I translate from Swedish. Um, and was very interested in, in it as described, wound up Googling around, found the playwright, in fact, on Facebook, <laughs> succeeded in sending him a direct message saying, I'm interested in having the script so I can translate it, perhaps. He writes back, he says, oh, that's great. I'd love to have you do that. I'm attaching a copy of the script. I'm also attaching a copy of a translation into English, which had been done by some colleague of his. And I looked at this and I thought, I'm not going to look at his text. I'm going to start and do my own translation. It's a project that's still in course, but I've done about a third of it. And at that point, I stopped. I looked at the other English version already prepared. It was obviously done by someone with a lot of UK experience. So the two were, were very different. I have the right to go ahead and translate it. But in all of these cases, I'm looking for a text that I can render into English actually to put on stage. Mm -hmm. And I think that's maybe that's the most puzzling part. Mm -hmm. And it's the part that's opaque that as you have described, there is a production process out there that's involving theater companies and yeah. we as literary translators are often not at all privy to it. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Or a comment? I, go ahead. I would just say in terms of, um, you know, generally theaters have dramaturgical departments. And so you want to get in touch with the dramaturgs. And well, she can't hear. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, I'm sorry. Um, theaters all have dramaturgical departments uh, or literary management departments. The terminology um, uh, varies. And they're the people you want to get in touch with unless you have director or actor friends who may wish to run with the play. You know, starting with a staged reading, perhaps. Um, but you, you need, that's the part you need to get. Because I think you were also saying um, um, production rights are separate. And each yeah. production needs its own um, transaction. Yeah. So you need to be careful about that. I think it's all, I've noticed lately with Polish plays that have been performed in the United States, it's quite often, it's quite common, it seems, for new translations to be commissioned for new productions. Exactly. Um, yeah. And I can think of two instances off the top of my head, and these were British productions that then came to the United States, okay. and a whole new script was commissioned in, into American English, you know, rather than adapting the old, the old translation. Um, so that's, you know, even, I think, so even for authors that have been, that have been translated in the past, it strikes me that there might be potential reaching out to literary departments in theaters and to dramaturgs and so on um, to, uh, to be able to, to, to shop around a new translation. Right. Do you know about bit. the theater communications group? T yes. They would be a good first stop for you. See, I have to get the rights for the pieces to, and before I can start trying to right. talk Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean that really. Good luck. Yeah, um, not so much for you, but maybe. Um, my question is when translating into English for an English production, there's always the question of where is that going to be performed? You know, I'm based on the East Coast, I'm translating into like my idiom, you know, my region. And and it's always a question when something is in the vernacular or slangy. I don't want to be limiting. I want it to be like specific, but I don't want it to be so specific that somebody says, "I can't say that. I'm not from there. It doesn't, you know, come off, come out of my mouth." 
Um, I just am curious how you would deal with maybe a director's translation or something, you know what I mean? Like a, you can't put footnotes for the audience, but maybe there's a way of packaging a translation of a play from a place that nobody knows about. You know, to say like this is this is the situation. You know, it would not be published anywhere. But to say like here's the context. I mean, the, do people do that? Or I, I, I for. Uh, to, 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 to sort of respond to that in a slightly different way, I mean, with the piece that I was working on, as I said, I was an American translator working with British actors, and I was actually really surprised how little of a problem it was, um, partly because I was living in the UK and was familiar with sort of UK ways of speaking, but also because good actors can make anything work. Um, and uh, and I, I was trying to remember if I could come up with a concrete instance of something that we had to change because it just didn't work for the actors. And, if, and I couldn't, which says to me that if there was anything, it was something fairly minor. And again, going back and listening to my translation, which was one of my very early translation projects, there's some real clunkers in there. <laughs> and, um, and the actors really make it work, you know? And that's what professional actors will do. So I think it's probably... You know, I've seen plays, I, 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 actually this is another really good example. I saw a production of a play um, by a, Pol a young Polish playwright called Dorota Masłowska. Um, and Masłowska writes about like working class Poles in Warsaw in like very, very rich working class Polish. Um, this play was translated into very, very rich working class British English. And then I attended a reading of that play in New York with American actors. The script had been adapted not at all. And they were performing this very, very British dialogue in American accents. And I knew that they were saying things that they did not understand, but they were making it work. <laughs> so, you know, I think if you, have, if you have the right actors and if you have the right production team, I think it's, you know, um, I think for the text itself, I, w I wouldn't worry about it necessarily too much. Yeah. And and I think they don't have to ask permission to change something, and they won't in any case unless they're the dramaturg. So they yeah. will right figure it out. Yeah, I mean that's. That a, depends. That's not always the case. Yeah. Some uh, publishers, translators, uh, authors are going to insist that you perform it mm. word by word. Yeah. So that can that can ruin the production. I'm not so sure that those requests hold very much weight anymore, unless the the status of the author is yeah. such that it would demand. I mean, I, I think that's one of the things that really distinguishes the translation of drama as a genre is that it's, it's the translation is never understood to be the final mm -hmm. version if, in fact, it's going to be produced. Right? Yeah. It's understood that yeah. it's going to be handed over essentially as a blueprint to the actors and directors and dramaturgs and you know, scenic designers and such and, uh, with much to be cut and changed. And yeah. I was going to ask um, any of you who have seen your um, your work produced, if, to what extent, like how you felt essentially about that, knowing that, or did you actually see mm -hmm. the results of things that had been excised, and it, it, was that a, a sort of more torturous had, process? As a uh, another of Griselda's plays, La Mala Sangre, or Bad Blood, was, um, uh, the translation was commissioned by the Gate Theater in London, and um, and I, the translation, they, they they took the script as the script. What uh, amazed me was the, the stylistic choices. Um, but it was, again, um, uh, it wasn't a question of language or, um, or phrasing. It was just that the director had a, a pace for this and a pitch for this script that I had seen the script building very, very kind of gradually and having its sort of crescendos and, and, and um, quiet places, and she just started at a pitch, and it just kept going. Hmm. And I was That's just really amazed by it. It had never occurred to me it would be done that way, and it was. So I think it's. I think there are two things. One is what can be done to change your words, and what can be done um, without at all changing your words, but in ways that are really, really um, surprising. And I'm not saying this was at all bad. It was hmm. just something that had never occurred to me. Yeah. Um, Really so yeah, theater is just an endless surprise. <laughs> it can be. Yeah. We're just about out of time. Are there any more questions or comments from the audience? No. 
Um, so I'd just like to give everyone on the panel, though, an opportunity to speak about um, anything that they're currently working on or would like, if there are any particular plays, um, dramatic works that they would like to, to do in the future, or a sort of dream project in this genre. Um, we've, we've heard from you about what yeah, you're working on yeah. now. <coughs> yeah, I'm doing this, yeah. Okay, do you have anything else you want to do? No, it's a part of my dissertation again, yeah. Thank you. And Marguerite, did you have any place well, coming up? Well, I've been um, translating um, mostly poetry and fiction, but Jen has this wonderful, and Jen and Anne have this wonderful, and, and I'm sorry, and Ben um, um, have this wonderful um, um, radio um, play project that you should talk about. It's really exciting. Um, well, we're the three of us, along with two other co-producers, are starting a podcast that's going to feature international radio dramas, um, both in English and in English translation. What's it going to be called? It's going to be called Play for Voices. Um, and so, if anyone in here um, who hasn't already identified themselves as such is a translator of drama and is interested in translating radio plays, um, please come up and let us know and, and give us your contact information, and we'd love to keep you in the loop and, and potentially collaborate with you. On that same note, um, we are, I think, mostly for the moment interested on things that are intended as radio plays. Um, and there is, in fact, a, a radio version of this play that I was just talking about. Um, so I will be excited to actually see how that radio version differs from the version that I translated and potentially see if it's interesting to us. There's also, um, I've translated, actually my first published translation was a novella by a very, very, very well-known, now very, very old, um, German playwright, so it was uh, unusual for him to be doing a novella, and I'm really interested in revisiting some of his earlier works, some of which were also adapted for radio. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, my my two dream projects are um, uh, the Polish uh, poet, speaking of Herbert, wrote uh, a number of plays, uh, all of which, to my knowledge, were originally radio plays that went, then went on to be staged in the 1960s. They're all really wonderful. A lot of them deal with the ancient Greeks, which was, Herbert was really into the Greeks and Romans, and then some of them also take place in, in 20th century Poland as well. Um, they're, they're funny, they're, they're, uh, they're incredibly intelligent, they're beautifully, beautifully written, they've never been translated into English. But his rights are kind of tied up in various places and he has various other translators, so I don't have high hopes. But my other, my other dream project is uh, a Polish play playwright called Tadeusz Swobodzianek, who wrote a play called Our Class, uh, which was produced in London several years ago um, about a, a pogrom that happened in Poland in the 1940s. He wrote a trilogy of plays called The Prophets, The, the Death of the Prophet, um, which is based on a true historical incident where in the northeast of Poland between the two wars, um, there was a man who founded a messianic cult where he claimed to be the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And there was another man who claimed to be the escaped Tsar Alexander II, <laughs> who had hidden out in the northeast of Poland and was gathering an army to return to Russia. And the two men were in the same part of Poland at the same time, but never met. And the plays are about what would have happened if they had. Wow. <laughs> and they're fantastic. And the three of them together are just about novel length. And I have dreams of getting a, a literary publisher to publish them as a novel. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Well, thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.